this is the best time to actually invest in Nigeria. However, what should a first time home buyer be looking out for? Honestly, this is very interesting and that's why I laughed hard because it's a long conversation you give me time. If you get your location wrong as a first time home buyer, it can discourage you from getting a second home. If you're not wealthy enough, rent. Buying a home is a good idea because whether or not I live in it or I rent it, the value still increases because the home you're buying serves as equity. Equity to take loans, equity to even do investment. What are some um, things that you've seen regarding the Airbnb space? Airbnb is very good, highly rewarding. However, it looks like a bubble that can bust anytime. And it's gonna bust from a place of <laughs> To be honest, if I have any investment in diaspora, that is the best time for them to invest in Nigeria. The reason is, if you are looking and you're trying to understand the real estate industry in Nigeria, I mean the peculiarities, you are looking to find out what you should put your money in, where you should not put your money in, how you should approach certain decision making, then this episode is for you because I've got with me a great friend of mine who is actually a leader in the real estate industry in Nigeria. And he has been working in this for over 10 years, working across various aspects of real estate. So his experience is quite vast, you know, and I've been able to bring him to have a conversation today. And we're going to dig into everything, you know, his journey, the industry, Airbnb, rent to own, I mean, or rent or own, you know, we are going to dive into the conversations today and there will be no holds barred. I promise you this is going to be a very exciting episode for you. So like, subscribe, share, get a friend to come join this channel now. And I look forward to having you in this episode. I have with me here, Mr. Ayo Bami <laughs> Polarin, like, like, like we always get to call him, but I mean, we call him Mr. EY yeah. Polarin all the time. And um, he's been a friend that I've known for, I think, almost 20 years. Yeah. I think almost 20 years now. And uh, he's someone that I've seen his consistency through the years in the real estate space. And you're someone that I think, quite interesting facts, uh, we actually be here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he reminded me of that recently. When I was <laughs> yeah, I be Elijah, he be as Elijah. Right. So he chooses not to be Elijah so that there can be a difference. <laughs> and then we call him AY. <laughs> and I mean, his brand actually, everyone knows him as AY. I mean, but well, AY, welcome. Thank uh, you very much. Um, can you please just um, introduce yourself to the audience that might not be knowing you right now? Uh, just like you said, my name is Ayobami Falari. Um, I have an MBA. Um, I went to school and lived in Abuja all my life. Some of my friends jokingly say I'll be the minister one day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's about. And I'm, you know, married with a daughter, um, and I'm passionate and absolutely in love with real estate. Oh so, wow, welcome! Yeah. I mean, that, that's that's a very interesting perspective to do. Most people we have on the show, we always say, "Oh, I'm the CEO of this." <laughs> but I mean. Mr. Ayo Falarin actually described himself with what he actually values the most, which is learning and his family, you know, and also, I also know he's very passionate about his faith um, and also passionate about real estate, you yeah. know, so strongly. And I think going, going through your journey, right, how did you begin into real estate? What sparked you into joining the real estate industry? What was that first day like? What was that motivation like? What was that glimpse of light that you saw? And then will obviously evolve into how it is today. I mean, I think this conversation must uh, begin from the foundational, you know, side of things, you know, of my life. Um, you know, I grew up in a one bedroom. Um, I, uh, what I understood growing up is uh, was sleeping on the floor uh, because we had a bed, you know, where the oldest of us slept on the chair and then the youngest sleep on uh, on the chair and the youngest sleep on the bed that was, you know, laid carefully on the floor. Mm -hmm. And when I got to my secondary school, which we both attended, of course. Yeah, um, actually I, we did attend the same <laughs> secondary school, quite interestingly. You know, so yeah. I, I started to engage with people that had their own bedroom, so I couldn't comprehend. Um, so the constraint of feeling like, you know, sleeping on the floor was very normal because it was at the time. Um, and the perspective I got from meeting other people made me, you know, make a decision that I wanted to do better. And I'm not saying that um, we were at that position, you know, forever because my dad, you know, later built a house. But that, from a foundational viewpoint, I always knew I wanted to have mine. I always knew I wanted to have a better life than, you know, what I had as, you know, growing up uh, as a kid. 
you know, so that is part of the fueling. And then when I got to university, I started doing, you know, many businesses. I remember doing T-shirts. Mm. I did T-shirts, but I had a very bad experience because, you know, when uh, the treading of a cloth is done from the corners. Uh, but for me, when I bought, bought these T-shirts, I uh, bought them in bulk, I think bulk of 50 or 100. I can't remember for a fact. And it got it started tearing in the middle where there was no joining. I was like, oh, my God. That, so that was that my was first, very poor quality you know, business decision. Uh, I, I just had a drive to try many things. I tried to do car dealership and all of that, but I somehow landed myself in real estate. And since then, I think that will be 2010, 2011 till date, you know, I've been in that industry. Um, and I've been doing a lot of things because I did a, a bit of freelance, uh, but in recent times I began to do more around uh, perfecting that freelance to become a more realistic uh, business, which has bettered the business called Real Fault. So, I mean, when you began your early days in 2010 into real estate, um, what kind of opportunities were you exploring back then and what were your hopes? I mean, obviously, a younger AY, you were looking at maybe um, the money in the industry. What was your motivation at that time? Uh, to be honest, I started very from a very funny perspective. I started in the local market. I started as a freelance and I started what I would refer to as today in the unrealistic market. Uh, then we were trying to sell billions at that age and it didn't make sense. I remember I had a friend that was, you know, um, with it, that went to NMS and I'll tell him, please, can you wear your uniform and, you know, take a stroll with me and just make these agents because I was a small guy in the midst of adult agents. And it, it couldn't make sense why a small boy like this wants to make billions. Uh, so we had deals, one billion, two billion. You can imagine what one billion felt and typically like. typically you will make 5% yeah. if you were able to get any of those deals. 5%, but, but I remember one of those times, one of the elderly people said, you know, took me aside and told one of the elder agents that even if this deal closes, we can't give this guy so, so much. We just give him 100,000 or 500,000. And the other agent came- to be making? <laughs> Uh, five percent of one billion uh, is fifty 50 million. million. So they were going to say they were going to give you five, five, fifty k or five hundred thousand. And the other agents came and said, "Look, this is what this man that." And I, I used to call him Daddy, of course. He was like a mentor. I said, ah, Daddy, how do we go about this transaction? It was my deal. We, I remember I went to the barracks to have like a meeting somewhere, and then the agent said, "Come, Mister Man." The man you're calling Daddy is look at what he's planning for you. You know, so it was such a rigorous. Um, experience because I was coming into a market space that I didn't quite understand and I was looking for billions, you know, so, and that wasn't really realistic for me. Uh, but at some point in 2011, 2012, something clicked. <laughs> well, I mean, this was after, after going through <laughs> series of, I remember then I, I'll leave, um, Guagalada, take the bus, wear the suit and tie, come to town just to see how I could close tra transactions. So, yeah. so how long did it take before you made your first deal? Like when, before you started uh, it real estate? It took about two Because I think at this time you were selling. Yeah. At this time you were selling. So you mean when you started selling real estate, it took you about two years to make your first two deal? Two and a half. I'll say three. Wow. Yeah. It happens. I have colleagues and friends that have done five years, no deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, no deal. But, but you see what, what happens when you start at that point, uh, when you are trying to put, push for the big deals, what comes at you is the rental deals. So you get rental deals. So I got some rental deals. So that kept you alive. And the rental deals can be maybe 500 K shared between 10 people. Right. So your portion might be 25, 30 K, but that keeps you, that gives you transportation, gives you inspiration. I remember it, there's a place called uh, Area 11 by the toilet or something like that. We used to go hang out with agents back in the day, you know. So, I mean, that's about the story. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I mean, but um, coming from that, uh, what were some lessons that um, you have picked? I mean, there are people that might be watching this that are currently at that phase. You know, what are some mistakes that you made within that period that have really stuck out for you? Um, one, of, one of the mistakes, just like I made reference to, is I, I learned to carry myself. You know, when you're doing transactions, carry yourself. I'm not saying you should fake. Uh, some people believe fake it to make it, but I feel carry yourself. The way you carry yourself, the people around the transaction become careful. 
not to, because there's something that's very common within the industry that is sidelining people. But when you carry yourself and speak with confidence, uh, people tend to tilt towards wanting to have a relationship with you and that way they will not sideline you on transactions. So that means, also, so you, obviously you began your career as an agent, as a yeah. very young age and you began pursuing deals that will, it will still give you a 5% commission that was typically due to the agent in every real estate transaction, right? And then going from there to um, now seeing the agent pool right now, what are some things that you think that's some mistakes that you see some agents doing today that they were to be, that you typically did in those days and they are not just generally learning from? I think one of the things that really personally annoys me is arrogance. Um, there's a lot of arrogance within the distrust and arrogance. And I understand where the distrust is coming from. Like I said, side, people are easily sidelined in this, in this part of the business, but that should not bet arrogance in you. Um, that should rather teach you how to be strategic in addressing and, you know, engaging with people. So for instance, if you call an agent today, right now, on, if we have to make a call, to an agent right now, he's gonna be arrogant. I can assure you. We can we can practicalize. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, he's gonna be arrogant, and it's gonna be from a place. Are you the buyer? You know, and I, and I yeah, understand. I, I've had a lot of people give that experience <laughs> because a lot of them say that why are they so forceful? Well, yeah, angry and all of that. I, I, and my approach to things like this, and I've learned over time, is mm. you can actually ask a question, two people asking the same question, but it's coming out differently. It's, it's all about the, the context and the continents and the tone of your question. I can actually figure if you were the buyer of a property without being arrogant to you, mm. you know, or, be com or being confrontational. So from, I mean, from that early days of being a general freelance local agent, how did your journey evolve um, through? How did you, have you built a career? I mean, right now, you're currently the CEO of Freelfords and also the CEO of um, Real Easy. And um, you have a lot of projects within the city of Abuja and you also have it, an army of people. Can you just tell us a bit about um, how that journey evolved from just being a freelancer? Or is it just not good? <laughs> So there's in a God component and side of things, but let me let me just say it's been a long journey. And I'll say that when I made the first money, I squandered. You know, obviously I squandered. And How much I, was that if you don't mind sharing? Ten million. Okay. Ten million. I squandered. Um, so you made ten million naira from yeah, the deal. Yeah. How old were you at this time? Or um, was this like when you had finished school or I was still in school. I was still a student. Well, you were in uni. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I I was one of those students that had a car in school. Okay. And, you know, the money got to me. And that's why sometimes when I see young people pushing, I'm like, no, sometimes uh, from a... From my belief, um, because I believe in God very strongly, um, sometimes like God doesn't want this thing for you. He doesn't want to give you what to break you. And that was my story because I, I ran semi-mad. <laughs> yeah. I ran semi-mad. In fact, my wife now mm. was my girlfriend. Then we broke up. <laughs> I said, I can't do this again. I need to roll with big girls. So first, <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I said, not you anymore. Uh, I got a car. You know, I started living very flamboyant. I remember squandering all my money in clubs. And, and I mean, to be at one of the clubs I remember very vividly is Cabana. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you, you had, well, the moment you got 10 millionaire, I mean, it reminds me of a quote that I heard by Charlie Monga. I mean, he just passed away. Um... Charlie Munger said something, he said that the problem with life is not actually making money, it's mm. staying sane after you've made money. So apparently, that, I think that proved, that proved it, right? That basically, it doesn't look like you ran mad. <laughs> I did. I mean, but prior to that, how much have you handled before? When you mean that? Uh, 50K, 20K. Ah, so from 50K, you went to 10. You, you, you know, um, I was living the largest you can imagine. I was driving a 2009 Honda Coupe. I, you know, tinted, all tinted black. It was such, it was such an experience, but I lost all of that money. You know, mm. because you asked the question, you said, what better real thought really is he? It's my journey. It's my journey. My journey has been you know, ups and downs, you know, I lost all the money. Um, I had to make it back, of course. And then I ended up doing Uber, you know, at some point I ended up doing Uber, you know, just to bring myself back. Uh, and, I, and I will not talk about 
how I made the money to buy the car for Uber. Not today. <laughs> really? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Not today. But but it was a very, um, I, I don't want to say dehumanizing, but to, to then I'll call it dehumanizing. Now I'll call it process. I'll call it a process that shaped me to be who I am today. And it's part of the process that made me... Now the money that I'm seeing now from the likes of Real Fort, for instance, um, is not able to shake me because I, I receive a lot every other day. Um, God has given us investors that trust us. And, you know, from the day we set up Real Fort, it's been a lot all the way. And trust me, I, I can't speak into how much of success the business has done within one year. Um, it's not a, by incorporation, Real Fort is older than one year, but one year is when we started business operation because we wanted to address real easy first by forming an army that will feed what we're doing at Real Fort. So can you, can you tell us a bit about Real Easy and what um, Real Easy is doing? So, so for me, the concept of Real Easy still points back to passion. There's a passion around, first of all, there's lack of you know, people often complain about no jobs here and there. And I saw my journey. I saw how it wasn't easy, but you can easily make a couple of millions. If you have the right resource, you have the right posture, you have the right mindset, you have the right network. You can become a millionaire, multi-millionaire being an agent. But you have to do it right. You have to drop things like arrogance, drop things like greed. So what we're doing really is we're trying to build an army of people, either young, old, you know, new in the business, teach them, train them, equip them with everything that is needed, you know, open them up to network so they can stand on their own. Mm. You know, so what we're doing, I often tell friends that Real easy for me is almost similar to an, like we're doing an NGO service, right? But it's not because we're trying to reach out to people to um, equip them to be able to sustain their lives. You know, so basically, real easy, I think from my understanding of what you said is it helps realtors like or agents, you know, become more professional. Right. You're trying to do like a professional um, body or a professional group or association for realtors or should I say what we call agents in Nigeria that will be able to help them um, with better training, with better understanding of the market, with also the network effect of how they can um, come together as one to be able to access opportunities. You know, I mean, I, I think um, that is really exciting. And I, I, I really am excited to see what that would evolve to become. Yeah. Uh, but what about real fort? What's Berted real fort? I mean, really Z sells properties, I think, from my understanding. And then real fort, um, you guys, is like a development side of this, right? So the thing with Real Easy, uh, Real Easy, as apart from what we're doing with agents, sensitizing them and equipping them, it's also, you know, it was designed to be a brokerage firm. Yeah. But why we transitioned to Real Fort is there was a dissatisfaction. You know the way brokerage works. Brokerage, just like the name, you broker a deal. So we are the middlemen to transactions. So you know where you come passionately, you have a client, for instance, you tell them, oh, this project is going to be delivered at the highest standards, highest quality, everything will be factored. And then the client comes in and sees a project void of all of the promises and you know, propositions and all of the things you said during the sales process. It becomes very hot in because as real easy as a broker, you don't have control of what a developer does. Mm. So we had to just do real foot because we wanted to have a control of how the, the experience, overall experience of a home buyer, you know, home buyer process. Mm. So now real foot, if you're buying a home, be sure to have reasonable spacing, be sure to have the highest quality of construction, be sure to have security in your investment. And all of those things were concerns, you know, during our brokerage, brokerage days, um, you know, to say the least. And it's a thing of, I remember during the real easy time, a lot of developers said, oh, you guys, you came into this brokerage business, yet you're not accepting our deals. I'm like, yeah, we're not accepting your deals because we feel a bit disconnected. Mm -hmm. And we're not certain that you can provide our clients the highest level of delivery of mm -hmm. service. Yeah. So it was more like um, the problems that you experienced from the selected um, real estate firms that really was servicing. Right. Because I, from my understanding of what you said, you, beyond just um, the army and the training, mm -hmm. you also 
were consulting for people that wanted to buy properties. So yeah. you were like the middleman, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, like a brokerage, right? So there was investment advisory and all. Um, so also, you now took those problems and um, took them to form Realfort. Now, in coming to form Realfort, right, as a company right now, what are some things that um, Realfort has been doing that um, is different from what we have currently in the market? Number one thing that we are doing at Realfort is we're, we're trying to emphasize convenience. Um, what we did when we looked at the inflation and all of the factors that are affecting pricing within the city of Abuja, we decided why don't we sell land and give people convenience to build at their pace. So what we did is we got a large plot of land, a large six hectare uh, land, and we portioned it into different housing types, from terraces to semi detached and what have you. So you buy into these lands and you can build at your pace. But we also supervise you know, the construction process to ensure that mm. it's aligned with industry standard and regulatory permissions, you know. So that's one of the things that I know, the core of our being at Real Fort. Mm. Looking into the current landscape, right, we've been hearing a lot of stories, like a lot of real estate, like home buyers are having issues with developers, right? A lot of people are not getting their homes as at when promised. Some people are not even getting homes at all. Like literally, it's almost like a real estate investment has now become the latest Ponzi scheme, right? And um, a lot of people are expressing fears in their hearts, not knowing who to trust, you know, in terms of um, real estate developers, you know. And so what are some, what, what do you have to say about this? And what are some ways that you would advise home buyers to actually think about investing in a home? I mean, obviously, I won't be able to address all of the concerns, but one of, let me see one or two things I can say based on my experience. Number one, I think it's important that because before you invest in any development or developer, you need to know the structure of management. What's the management structure? It's very important um, because I'm not, I, I don't mean to be controversial, but when personally, if you're a one-man business, um, I'm first alerted until I'm proven otherwise. But when I know the structure within the company and I observe the way the management, you know, at that level, they live their lives, it can give me an idea of how to navigate that investment. And then sometimes people take the risk, which is a very, very unbelievable risk of not bringing their lawyer on board on transactions. It's very important. Review the terms of agreements I have with developers, look at it very properly and then have your lawyer review it as well. Mm. That's very important. There's something we Nigerians don't like to do and that is insurance. Insurance, there's insurance in real estate and you need to know how to, you know, I, I can count a thousand cars in the city of Abuja and I'll tell you that 90 or 80% of those cars are not insured, including mine. <laughs> <laughs> really? So yes, I'm a corporate. Okay, I know you're not, but I'm a corporate. No, I am. I, 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 think, so, I think I know. I think. Do you mean beyond the basic insurance that? No. So the basic know. insurance is compulsory, yeah, right? Because I, compulsory. I'm talking about comprehensive. If okay. you want to get value for you know insurance value, you have to go comprehensive. Yeah. So I'm talking about comprehensive. And I mean, even for the basic insurance, the local taxi man doesn't even know he has insurance. So that's why you have accidents and people are shouting, they don't know if they can refer to insurance. So it's important people are um, understand that you need to insure your house. And then you also need to, uh, you know, speak, in, speak to the banks speak to the banks to get some form of, you know, guarantee in that regard. So I think this is, these are things that people need to take into consideration before, you know, putting their money into investments like that. And track record, most importantly, track record. But it's just that the thing with track record sometimes blinds, blindfolds us from making investment. And then we discover that this person has a track record. How come did they make this mistake? That's why you go back to their structure, as their structure changed, what is the legal requirement, insurance, and all of those things. It's but, paramount, yeah. But, but I think also we've seen um, some people that have met these requirements that are still um, having some issues. Yeah. So, so for me, what I'll say here is, 
I don't know if this song comes right. Money slow to enter, money quick to go. That's the song, right? So it should be more of money comes however it comes, or money must be very slow to go out. You notice that sometimes your instincts for people that just feel everything, for me, spiritually, I'll say my spirit or the Holy Spirit will tell me, take slow in your investment. I mean, myself and my partners uh, at Real Fort, we have tried to invest in some deals and then we delayed for a bit. And then we discovered all of the things that were hidden mm. in that transaction. So you should never be in a hurry. Sometimes you have people, this money is in my account. What do I do with it? So I think it's important you take time mm -hmm. before you disburse investments. Yeah. You know, that's another strategy to adopt in whatever it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, I think, you so, know. So, but looking at also from the developer side, you know, I, I think one of the things that has been happening is I've been seeing a lot of the developers who start practicing certain things that has bothered me um, from the aspect of inter-project borrowing. So you have them having multiple projects, you know, that are currently going on and then you take from one project to do the other and hoping that the inflow for this one would be. And I, and I think well-intentioned, really, um, from my own perspective, right? I, I read an article and they, that's where I'm actually getting most of these ideas from, right? So well-intentioned and you see them they borrow from one project and they put into the other one. And some of them get carried away by the amount of money that just comes in, you know, unfortunately. You know, they just get carried away and then they just carry it. And before you know, we are seeing them with lavish cars and uh, lavish lifestyles, you know. And eventually, we don't even know who we invested in anymore. I think which comes back to what you were talking about, really. Understanding the management and understanding the... Um, the what do you call it the, their lifestyle and how the how the corporate governance within the organization actually functions right um but looking also i think something that has really interested me in the real estate space right now has been the whole idea of the market diaspora right so um what what do you what i what, what are your thoughts around the diaspora market because we have a lot of jackpot right and then some people say they will jack and then they will jack that, you know, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite funny, right? Yes, but, it is. Um, regarding real estate and the diaspora markets, um, I think recently we heard about um, the government giving, um, what do you call the mortgages to people, Nigerians in diaspora. So what, how, what, what, how should people be thinking about that? Uh, for me, it's um, I don't I don't know if I should call it a dream come true. I remember having a conversation with my uncle a couple of years ago, and he said, "I'm not interested in real estate in Nigeria, except there's a you know there's a mortgage op option." And I think I would understand why they think like that because there's mortgage all over the system that they currently operate and live in, right? So yeah. now having their home country uh, integrates this into uh, home buying. Uh, process, especially for people in diaspora. I think it's a very interesting thing and a conversation that a lot of people in diaspora should want to know how to go about. I was chatting with someone um, just two days ago and, you know, they expressed interest in accessing the finance. But what I just want to say is anything that has to do with government to some extent can be really slow. Mm. Right. And I just want to say this. If the government can put in a structure and systems in place to make it easy, because it's very easy to say you're, you want to give 50 million. Mm. But how accessible, how swift is the access to these funds? Mm. Because I'm going to share my own experience. It took me about three years to get mortgage from the Federal Mortgage Bank, for instance. Wow. And I live and reside in Nigeria. And I had to be going to the office from time to time. I had contact. So I, I'm not very sure. This is a system that was just introduced, right? Mm -hmm. um, number one, from the diaspora perspective, I expect you guys to stay on board, get ready for more details from people like us. Right. But on the government side of things, government, please, I think it's important that we make this run through the right way so that the people don't come in. They are discouraged and they're like, what's going on here? So I think those are the two things that, that uh, you know, I have running in my mind at the moment. So, but I mean, looking at the diaspora audience, so I'm going to come to the fact that how should someone from diaspora, I mean, the, the age old story we've all heard and we've all experienced or know someone that experiences. I'm abroad, I'm sending money to my brother to build a house for me. And then eventually I come back for holiday and then my brother says, this is the land and I don't see a house there, right? So, how, I mean, and this has burnt a lot of um, people in diaspora's um, 
mind from investing in real estate in Nigeria. What are some things that um, you think people in the diaspora can think about or how can they better approach um, this model? Considering the fact that, I mean, if you look at it, that a lot of times now the dollar is up, right? The Naira is down and their monies can actually buy more in this country. So what, what are your thoughts around that and how can... Um, to be honest, it. to be honest, if I if I have any friend, cousin, brother, you know, and or investor, everybody in Nigeria and in diaspora, I would um, go on my knees and beg them that this is the best time for them to uh, invest in Nigeria because of the exchange rate, you know, fluctuation and advantage. Um, the reason is, and, and they must understand because there's a way to go about this. If you're looking at investing in Nigeria and then you want to, you cash it back into dollars or pounds, for instance, there's a likelihood that you lose because of the transactional cost uh, mm -hmm. in exchange. But what I would say is what we're doing at Realford, for instance, is like I said, you buy a land and you build out your pay. So now, first of all, you go through a process of buying the land and then you send in, and we have a system, we have a technical department at Realford. The reason we set up not amongst other things. Part of the reason we set up this technical department is to address Nigerians and diaspora that want to build just like you've raised the concern. Mm. Now, the process is your borderland, you want to build. Let's do the DPC. We're not in a hurry to collect your money because we want you to follow the project with us. So let's do your DPC. When we, we're done with your DPC, we send you pictures, you send someone to come verify the process. If it's okay by you, give us the next phase, this phase of money. We're not interested, we're not eager to take money from you. We want to build this house with you uh, so you are aware of the process and the stage of the, the construction works. And one of the things we're trying to do at Railfort is to integrate CCTV live feed cameras. So while you're in the comfort of your, your home in, in, in Atlanta, you can log on your, your, your laptop and see what is going on on site. So those are the things that we're trying to do for so the diaspora market. Your, your model of building and your technology. Right, yeah. So we're leveraging technology and, you know, the model of building. We're not in a hurry to take your money. We want to work together. So you're not in Nigeria, but it feels like you're in Nigeria building your house. You know, that's one to take people along. And now from the perspective of investing, I think the exchange rate advantage, this is the best time to actually invest in Nigeria. Hmm. However, you must have the mindset that this investment must be domiciled in Nigeria. So you can use it to fund your lifestyle when you're around. You don't want to, you can domicile your investment in Nigeria, use it to fund and assist your parents, assist your brothers. If for any reason, which is very, very rare, you know, your spouse is here, you can fund, use that investment to fund their lifestyle. But if you want to assume that you can invest and then liquidate and send back in dollars, you're likely to lose. Okay, I mean, let, I'm, I'm, let, let me now drive a question towards an age old, uh, well, let's like say an age old, I will say a recent argument that has been flying around and I really like your perspective to it in terms of renting or buying. <laughs> like, so, I mean, I, I once had, I've had different school of thoughts, right? Uh, I've had different school of thoughts. I've had school of thoughts that say that if you're a young person, don't buy, you know, rent. And then there are some people that said, oh, that's an incomplete advice. So what they said was, don't buy. Don't buy for, don't buy to live, but buy and rent out if you can afford it. Then there's another school of thought that says you don't need to bother about owning real estate. If you check the value of rent you pay every year, it's going to take you almost 20 years to be able to really um, spend that money using buying a single unit. So don't buy at all. Just focus on living your life. Be flexible so that you can be mobile and travel the world. You know. And so I've, I've had a lot of different perspectives, right? So what are, what 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 do you, what's your take on this um, question? Honestly, this is very interesting, and that's why I laughed hard because it's it's a long conversation. If you give me time, um, so I have my perspective, and I I think I was listening to Grant Cardone recently, and he said, "If you're not wealthy enough, don't uh, buy rent." But there are contradictions. Uh, one of my mentors said, "You should rent rather than buy." He's a billionaire. Um, so that you know, I understand that he's talking from a place of experience. But what I think is there are factors. If you have a business that if you invest in can scale and you have projections of how much 
of return it can give you, then I would say, don't buy. Use right. the money to start up. Use business. the money. Not even, okay, it could be start a business or scale the already existing business. I'd rather say for this person scaling, rather for the person starting. Mm. Starting, there are risk components. You don't know what yeah, to expect. Validate. You're still trying to discover. You're at the yeah. discovery stage. Starting can be risky. So the risk is higher, you know, but renting in the context of having an existing business and you know, okay, let's put figures. You have 40 million. If you put 40 million to your business, it's going to give you 80 million. Oh. Would you rather, you know, put that 40 million in buying a home or put that 40 million in scaling your business? Now, let me speak for myself. I am on the uh, corner of buy. And I'm going to share a practical experience. All right. Two years ago, um, okay, let, let me not put it this way. Two years ago, there are two friends. One has 40 million. 40 million is going to scale his business to 80. The other one has 40 million to buy a three bedroom apartment and a BQ. And he goes and he buys a three bedroom apartment and a BQ. Mm. And now the three bedroom apartment and a BQ today is 120 million. Mm. And then the business, yeah. He invested in the business 80 million. So now both of them have succeeded, right? But now what is the definition of success in this context is determined by the goal set by the individual. Mm. What do I define to be success? That's what de de determines which direction I'll take. Exactly. So for me, I think buying a home is a good idea because while some people will say invest it, the home is still appreciating the value. Still an Whether or not I live in it or I rent it, the value still increases. So, but what you must have in mind, like me, be ready to deal. Because the home you're buying serves as equity. Equity mm. to take loans, equity to even do investment. Like for instance, I'm that guy, I, I, I don't know if this is okay. <laughs> I'm that guy who went for the three bedroom. Mm. But I'm that guy who is flexible enough to liquidate that three bedroom when I see an opportunity that is guaranteed mm. of return. Mm. So I, I, when I think and I sleep on my bed in my house, I feel the sense of having capacity in equity. Mm. So I've not really made the wrong decision by buying a home two years ago. Mm. So basically what you're saying is that the home is still an asset that you can... It's still an asset. And it increases in value on a daily basis. Mm. So there's no win-win. I think it's both correct. But personally, I'll buy a home. So basically, you just feel like it's based on the context. It's of, based on the context. And the person's definition your of definition success. of success, your goals mm. in regards to, you know, uh, your financial goals yeah. in regards to investment. I think it's, it's a very interesting. So, so, so I mean, uh, moving forward a bit, um, still a bit in this line, what should a first time home buyer be looking out for right now in the market? Location. <laughs> location, if you get location wrong as a first time home buyer, it can discourage you from getting a second home. Mm. But if you've gotten a first home and you understand how the industry works, then you can play around other factors. But how do I know the right locations to, to invest in? There are many factors, there's, there's demand, there's demand, there is infrastructure, the, the movement of infrastructure. Where is the government going part time? I mean, there was a news recently. I, I'm not I'm not sure specifically. Um, Maitama too. Mm. If you if you know if you know that area, yes, I'm um, there. I know that there's an approved couple of billions of naira going that direction. That's a location to look at. Mm. That's a location to look Any at. Any other location that you want to look um, at? I mean, it will look as though I'm talking about myself. But obviously, Idu Sabo, um, that is a location that I personally fell in love with. Mm -hmm. You know, I fell in love with Idu Sabo because I saw the direction of infrastructure that the government was ready to invest in that area. Mm. You know, and that's an area that is going to come up really fast in the next few years or, you know, months. So, I mean, so I should go and get all my money and start running to it. <laughs> so, look, I mean, going forward a bit, like right now we've seen the rise of um, very interesting business models from the likes of Uber to the likes of Airbnb right now coming to the real estate sector, right? So the whole aggregator model or shared model has become a thing, you know, with technology and all. And right now we have almost everybody has an Airbnb somewhere where they rent out like a guest house kind of thing where they rent out 
their properties and then people stay in it for a certain period of time, be it whether they're on vacation or just want a new environment to um, rest, right? So what are some um, things that you've seen regarding the Airbnb space? Do you think, is it good? Is it bad? Is it something everyone should do? Um, what are the pros and the cons? Airbnb is very good, very highly rewarding. However, in my opinion, it looks like a bubble that can bust any time. And it's going to bust from a place of regulation. Mm. It's going to bust from a place of regulation. Not even demand and supply. Pardon? Not demand and supply. Demand and supply is a factor as well. Okay. But there's a regulation side of things. Demand and supply is a factor. Um, you see, when it comes to demand and supply, the what will stand you out is the aesthetic value that you represent. When I mean aesthetic value, what is your de decoration preference? How have you been able to decorate the internal spacing of your Airbnb? That would be a huge determinant factor within a competitive space. Mm. However, the bubble that will bust is regulators. Mm. There is Airbnb all over the place. Mm. You have some apartments where there are families and then people sneak in and do Airbnbs. Yeah. It's not a sustainable model. With time, the government will take note of these things and the bubble is likely to bust. However, if you do it right, with the right approvals, you can actually um, make a lot of money from it. Mm, sounds great. All right. So considering um, business people like entrepreneurs who are looking to invest in real estate, do you think uh, real estate is actually a good source of um, passive income? Or how should, or I actually rather say, how should entrepreneurs or businesses approach real estate investing? Um, I think it's goal setting. Number one, is it short, mid or long-term goals? Number two, are you looking for ROI in bulk or you're looking for passive income? By the time you set your goals from all the aspects of your expectation, your budget, your preferences, it can help you, you know, organize things better. Mm. So once you have that structure and direction, then you know the best way to go. But one thing I know is you can never go wrong investing in real estate. You can never go But wrong. how should they approach it? What aspects of real estate do you think a business should be looking to invest in? So personal opinion, land. Land. The reason I say land is land cannot be broken, it cannot spoil, it cannot be demolished. It cannot <laughs> uh, decay, right? It's there. You can now add value to the land. So that's how I see it. But if you want to, you know, passive income, you can go for apartments. You can go for apartments. But it depends on, like I said, short, mid, or long-term goals. Mm. And also your budget, your tre the threshold or your capacity. Let me say your capacity. If you have a robust capacity, because you mentioned organization, I'll tell you to invest in apartments or commercial real estate within, we'll say to Amaitama, mm. and you'll be settled. And why am I saying that? You'll be settled because, for instance, let me give an instance. If you invest in Maitama apartments, right? If you invest in Maitama apartments, you can service the expatriate market and earn in dollars. Mm. A two-bedroom within, you know, that model, that business model, this is about $100,000. Wow. A two-bedroom apartment. Like fully furnished. Fully furnished in the heart of Maitama. It's for about $100,000 for expatriates. Wow. You know, so that's a business model in itself. Mm. So it depends on your target market and, you know, your capacity. But um, my next question will be, how do you think... A business person, like let's say you are a young business and you don't have the money to buy a new office, so you want to rent. What are some things that one should questions one should ask, and things that one should look out for? You want to rent or you want to buy? Rent. Hmm. Rental market. I, I left rental market a couple of years ago. <laughs> okay, you want to buy? You want to buy? Um, for me, I, 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 so like it's still similar to the rent or own. Uh, conversation we had earlier. So as a business, you would have to have serious capacity to be thinking of buying an office. Mm. <laughs> you know, to, to be thinking of buying an office. So I, I wouldn't really advise, you know, so I, I'll still say stay within the rental space. 
I think the most important thing is security. When you look at, if you, if you care about, you have to care about your staff, the welfare, because not everybody will own a car, right? So one of the things you must think about when you want to rent an office is security mm. of your staff and even yourself as well. And it must be within proximity to, you know, easy transportation and all of that. And, and there are there um, ways that you think one can make a smart decision, like in terms of what are some clauses that one should look out for in the engagement with the landowner, with the uh, property owner? Um, clauses. I, I think that that's more of a legal question. But from my experience, one of the clauses that I will personally look at is clauses that protect me so that I'm not kicked out of my office uh, without planning. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so that that would be one clause I think one must look at. Okay. Yeah. So now, I mean, going beyond. And then another one, sorry, is the how rent is increased. Mm -hmm. You know, so you must look at clauses that it's a prerogative of the home or the owner of the building to increase rent at any time. Clauses like that should be removed completely. Really? <laughs> yeah, because you, you need to consult with me. As a business, we need to plan. You, you, you can't just increase the rent without prior and adequate um, notification. Uh, you know, and not, notification and consultation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what are some things that you're currently excited about in the real estate space in terms of technological advancements? Uh, to be honest, I enjoy the whole automation thing. Uh, like personally, in my house, uh, if you ring yeah, the bell, in my house, I can sit here and open the door for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really an exciting thing to do. And it feels more secure watching my kid, uh, you know, Beautiful. with my CCTV. Um, it feels also secured. But I mean, it's also making us lazy, some of us, because I can switch on my lights, my TV. So I'm almost doing nothing <laughs> at all because everything is operated with, you know, technology. So and I'm really excited about that as much as it's also might make us a bit lazy as it's doing to me. True. I get I get I get what you mean. Yeah. Have you ever um, sold to a Gen Z before? Sold. <laughs> I think I have. And what was your what was your experience like? I think I have. I think I have. Um, but I'm not very sure if she's a Gen Z because she's. I, I never really asked, but she looks really young, and she was for for some reason she was very receptive, and um, but I, I was tempted to ask where did you get the money? <laughs> <laughs> but all the professionalism I've learnt over the years, I'm like. You can ask you that. Can you ask that question. Yeah, I think it was a two-bedroom apartment. So, if you could give one piece of advice into uh, to anyone, really, well, okay, you know, let me, let me, let me put it this way: if you give one piece of advice to three people, a home buyer, or like an investor, like a property investor, uh, an agent, a real property agent, and then uh, what do you call it now? A developer, what would those ideas, what would those advice be? One, one each. So for a home buyer, get a professional. Please get a professional. Don't attempt to do it by yourself. That's, I have a lot of things to advise home buyers, but the best thing I think you need, and everything you need is found in a professional. I must emphasize professional with track record and experience. Mm. Now for agents, you need to be patient. <laughs> agents need to be patient. <laughs> it's like agent and patience. There's a <laughs> there's a fight. <laughs> there's a serious, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's it's really where your success is hidden. Because in patience, you are able to navigate. You're able to understand. You're able to review. You're able to see clearly. Because in lack of patience, you don't see things as they are. Mm. Right. Uh, there are oftentimes my my experience. I've I've had to go buy properties in millions mm. on behalf of clients, but because of lack of patience from the agent side, we don't end up buying that property because they are like, "Where's your buyer? Where's your buyer? Do, look, I'm the buyer. If you think about <laughs> it, I'm, I'm the, the buyer because yes. I'm a representative. I'm a representative so be patient and listen to what I have to say. Understand what I have to say, and you see that a lot of people will make it. For developer, deliver what you promise. So that is to say, don't deceive people. Mm. Deliver what you promise. Mm. You know, that, those are the 
I mean, that's, that's, that's actually a powerful one. So I'm going to give you some, what I call rapid fire questions, hmm. right? <laughs> they are very easy. They are very, they are very easy okay. uh, questions, but uh, you will just have to answer them in a short period of time. They are, they are this or that. Um, if the government could do something, let's say you are present for a day and you had a magic wand in your hand that whatever you fix now will be fixed, what would you fix in Nigeria? I'll fix all the roads, even within the streets, the communities, and every, everywhere. Why? Um, because that that would when when you have roads, when you have access roads, people would move towards developing. So naturally, if I have a road within my area, okay, uh, where my family house is in Life Camp for twelve or thirteen years now. There's no access road. One thing I know, if there's access road, people will contribute. The association of landlord will contribute and put street lights. As well of landlord will contribute and find water. They can do that in Boho. We can, you know, there's alternative power supply, but there's no alternative road. There's no alternative to road. That's true. You That's know, true. so even the alternative is not sustainable, mm -hmm. right? So if I have my solar, I'm sorted for light if I don't have a high consumption. For water, I, I do Boho. <laughs> you understand? For security, I do local vigilante. But for road, there's no there's no other option. <laughs> I mean, you forgot to give advice to um Okay, you give advice to the investor. Yeah. Okay. You give homeowner, advice to the homeowner, developer yeah. and agent. Developer and agent. Yeah. So for the developer, right? If you were going to be one developer today, who is one developer that you that's currently exciting you in the way they are delivering? Me. Real fault. <laughs> <laughs> Real fault. <laughs> Real fault. He just added like our president. <laughs> okay. Okay, so number three. If you if you were starting out, like assuming you were starting out again today, like you have you're not Mr. Y, you're not a wife for Larry, you're not anything that anyone knows you to be. But you are starting out from real estate today, what market will you start in? Development. Oh, residential or commercial? Residential. And then I'll transition to commercial. Hmm. Yeah. Why? Development. Be because like I said, being a broker hurts me so much. I don't like when I tell people that this is what you're going to get, but they get otherwise. It's very painful. So now I want to be the creator of the product mm. in the sense that I'm the developer. So I develop it. So I'm going to develop things based on your need. Based on, demand. Based on demand, based on you know market demand, and I'm sure because of demand you get rewarded. Mm. And then also I'm gonna do products that are acceptable. Mm. For instance, when you're developing, I often tell developers, you must take it to cognizance the living room space, the kitchen space, the master bedroom space. Once you settle those three spaces. I think every other thing can be basic. But you see those three spaces, you must be deliberate about it. Mm -hmm. So being a developer, I want to do things, you know, better. So yeah. another question. What's one country in the world right now that their real estate trips you? And uh, you feel like I'd love to bring this to Nigeria? <laughs> to be honest, to be very honest is Dubai. <laughs> 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 to be very honest is Dubai. Why? And why, the aesthetics is amazing. Uh, first of all, 15 floors, 20 floor buildings, everywhere looks so beautiful. I mean, you've been to Dubai, you've been to yeah. JBR, you've been yeah. to, to the city I mean, center. Skyscrapers it's, and everything. it's just crazy. Um, and that is why they're, 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 they're making so much money uh, from their um, tourists. tourism. tourism. Yeah. They're making so much because when you look at the ambience, so definitely Dubai. Hmm. Interesting. Final question I'll ask you is that, is there currently any um, problem that you feel within the real estate sector that you wish you could solve now, 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 that will cause the sector to, to grow? Passionate. Passionate. It's, it's a broker problem. It's not a developer problem. It's a broker problem. I feel that it should be put into a law that, you know, all agents, Brokers, realtors, as the case may be, should be registered under a body and they should have uh, modus operandi. Mm. So, so that their commissions are protected, so that they behave right, so that that thing will change the sector completely.
so that people don't cut corners, people don't, you know, cheat each other. They do, there needs to be a structure within the realtor space. I mean, there's already redone for developers, mm -hmm. but they need something that can, you know, coordinate the affairs of realtors. Because now, to be a realtor, all you need to do is to wake up. <laughs> and just wake up, pray your morning prayers, and just up, update streets. on Facebook and Instagram. I'm a realtor. And that is not proper. I think what needs to happen is there needs to be an institution where you go through, write maybe exams, pay fees. The rigorous process will reduce fraud within the system. Yeah, because I mean, obviously it's a professional practice and it's a Professional career. practice. And where, even if abroad itself, you can't just even try. You can't it. just wake up and be, it, it, there's a rigorous process that you have to go through. You have to be licensed. Mm -hmm. I was having a chat with an agent one day and I said, she said, I was trying to correct her on something she did. And she said, I'm a licensed realtor. I said, license in Nigeria? Say yes, I have my CAC. I said, no, that's not a license. That's not a license. <laughs> that's, that's it, yeah. You that's can practice business, you can, you know, you can do business, you can do transactions, but you're not a licensed realtor. Mm. Get it right. It's not the same thing. Wow, wow. How can our audience um, keep in touch with you and the work that you're doing? I have an Instagram page, AYFlow. Mm. I have a YouTube page as well. You can get in touch with me. You can get my email. Um, we, whatever, if you reach out to Real Easy in any way or Real 40 in any way, you can always connect with me. But directly, you can connect with me on uh, Instagram, AYFlow. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. So, guys, I mean, this was really a phenomenal conversation. Thank you for joining the talk. Like I said, share this with someone that you know needs to hear this. Follow, subscribe, ensure that this channel, we keep creating great content for you because actually we love it when you watch our content. The more you watch it, the more you give us feedback, the more we are motivated to create more content that's relevant to you. And if there are any topics you feel you want us to talk about, hit us in the comments below and tell us more about those type of content that you want and we will not fail to give you valuable content on this channel, Venture Valley. Mm -hmm. I would also like to remind you and refer you to a video that I did once uh, with Benga Toto here about how to build a global team. It's really, really phenomenal. You'll see it in the link below. Go and watch that video. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day.